I shouldn't have with nobody. <clears throat> Sometimes it's this. We got some sick people out there. I don't think he's guilty. I mean, if I think he's done other bad things, I mean, clearly from the documentary, even things that he admitted to doing, but I don't think he necessarily did it now. I'm not sure about Stephen Avery being guilty, but I think Brendan Dassey, I just think he's been manipulated. I don't think that he... He's basically like a, a mentally challenged person who they put in jail for being an accomplice to a murder that he probably wasn't even there for. I think probably the, the everything that surrounded the first the first case and the... Um... It's also the first time we're just behaving as if we're allowed to be there. Shooting and listening to everything Kratz has to say about what Steven did and it was very shocking because we had that a lot of what was on the news had nothing to do with what was going on and yet that was the public narrative and then there's what's actually happening. He's just saying that and you can believe it, you can not know what to think, all of that. But then as you start to hear a little bit more from the family, you start rethinking what all of this means. Detectives went through his Google search history. They told me what they found. Or how much jail time would I do for possessing child pornography? How could there not be any pictures of her bones there? Nope, they Remember were just, that? Nope. That pissed me off. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, known as NECMEC, works with federal, state, and local law enforcement to identify children in photos who are being sexually abused. Here's how it works. Internet service providers like Google, Yahoo, and others monitor the billions of uploads and downloads of material with algorithms that search for possible child pornography. The disturbing admission of child pornography from Manitowoc County. The man told police he made an agreement with a woman that she would send him pornographic photos of children and he would try to sell them on the internet. Through purchases from a child porn club. not only gotten out, squandered whatever opportunity he had to like rebuild his life, killed this poor innocent young woman who he's lured to his property because he's this sex crazed maniac basically. Mm -hmm. And not only that, he's gotten his 16 year old otherwise innocent nephew involved. Chained and tied to the oh, bed it is. It's... and stabbed and cut and her raped. neck. That's what Brendan and, had you yeah, know, said, apparently. And cut her hair off, sawed it off with a knife, and all this stuff. This horrible and shit. All the evidence points to her being murdered elsewhere. Stuff as well as the bones right. that were never confirmed to be hers. I know, man. And they were just shipped off to the family and never oh. tested in a lab, and now they're gone forever. Gone forever. Unless they can be exhumed from somewhere or something to even confirm it's her. You know, somebody, she lost her life, her family lost a, a daughter and, and sister and all that good yeah. stuff. But this is what bugs me, is they don't, you would think they want to know the truth, and if, it's, if it brings any doubt to what they heard from the prosecutor, Ken Kratz. Oof. Oh, Lord. Um, yeah, that's the thing. There's this whole story about being chained up to the bed and being raped. There's no... Where does that come from? I think it comes from Brendan's confession. I think what the police were trying to do is find some sort of motive for Stephen Avery. They had to find some motive and they couldn't find any. So, oh, because he doesn't really have a reason to kill her? Exactly. So that's where the whole you know, interrogation of Brendan and the rape allegations come into play. So I think that they felt they needed Brendan to tell them things that would give Stephen Avery a motive. And many times he doesn't get to the one that they want to hear. And so they just come out and say, well, I'm just going to come out and say it. Who shot her in the head? And then he goes, oh, it, he did. You know, like, Brendan doesn't know the answers. And they keep asking him all these questions. And D does he say he did or does he say Stephen did it? He says he did. Not, he doesn't say Stephen. So did. he doesn't even say a specific name. But what he will not say is if he thinks Avery murdered Teresa Halbach alone or if he had an accomplice. The evidence that we've uncovered establishes that Stephen Avery at this point invites his 16-year-old nephew 
to sexually assault this woman that he's had bound to the bed. But instead of running for help, prosecutors say Brendan joined in. After the sexual assault is completed, Stephen Avery tells Brendan what a good job he did. But I guess they were talking to Brendan last night. Yeah. I guess they got it all on film or tape or whatever. What we did that night. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, what you're telling me. Oh. Uh, I'm a little concerned about you talking over the telephone. That investigation continues, and we're not going to comment on that. We know Mr. Avery is the individual responsible for the, her taking of her life. Oh, must be on what's on, is on the computer. Huh? What's on the computer? I don't know. You know what else I heard? You guys took pictures of her. Did you take the pictures? No. Did Steve take pictures? No. You tell somebody you took pictures? No. You told Travis that? Have you talked to anybody about this online? It has gone from bad to worse for the DA who admits to sending sexually harassing text messages. It's sometimes called hypersexuality, sometimes sexual compulsivity. The street name is sex addiction. Calumet County DA Ken Kratz could barely contain his disgust as he tells about how the boy discovered his uncle raping Teresa Halbach in his trailer. Wisconsin District Attorney Ken Kratz is accused of sending lewd, suggestive text messages and even offering to trade legal favors for sex. 26-year-old Stephanie Van Grohl came forward first. A Calumet County official says a year ago, the county hired an outside firm to investigate Kratz because some employees were uncomfortable with him. However, the outcome of the investigation, he says, is confidential. Our prosecutors have concluded that they cannot prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed a specific violation of a criminal law. Then last week, a second unidentified woman came forward claiming she too had been harassed by Kratz. The State Department of Justice says it will not file charges against former Calumet County Prosecutor Ken Kratz. On Tuesday, a third woman. We were not aware of any other allegations and had no reason to believe there would be a reoccurrence of Mr. Kratz's conduct. She says in January, Kratz revealed details of an ongoing murder case to her and then invited her to witness the victim's autopsy with one particular requirement, that she act as his girlfriend and wear high heels and a skirt on the bizarre date. Now, Kratz pleaded no contest to six different charges today, including two charges of sexual harassment. Now, the Office of Lawyer Regulation will have up to 30 days to make a recommendation of a punishment to the Supreme Court. The Office of Lawyer Regulation could sanction Kratz. That office did not return our call. We also called Kratz's office. He did not call us back. confirmed this with John a couple weeks ago when I talked to him is I said something has to be really really wrong that something is deep dark secret kind of thing has to be operating and it has to be the way that they were treated and of course as we got more as I got more and more information it was incredible what they were going through the there's much psychological abuse and emotional abuse as well as the sexual abuse had he already disclosed the sexual abuse? Oh, he had disclosed it to uh, the cousins knew about it. And incest is a hard, a hard concept for people to grasp, I think. And, and so I can see where, and it's certainly something that the brothers didn't talk about. From the time I was born until I was 10 years old, a pedophile lived in my home, documenting my body and the way it was abused every year as I grew. He took these images and videos, and when the technology became available, began distributing them online. We have just a lot of uh, CDs, uh, videotapes that we have to go through and observe and see if there are any other images, uh, if we can identify uh, possible 
victims. If we took a computer in, we would have to send it out and wait for another agency or someone at the state or an outside uh, uh, lab to do a forensic examination on it. Authorities were able to crack a major child porn case thanks to some new technology. NECMEC stands for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Our role is to be the centralized reporting location for child sexual abuse material. We have a team of analysts that sift through tens of thousands of reports every week. As I'm coming across a report now and looking at it, I'm looking for clothing clues, things in the background. Is there a water bottle that I can figure out what brand it is? And this is what I'm using to try to figure out who is this person that has potentially traded or distributed this image and where are they located? issue, but one that is growing. The production of millions of pornographic images of children being sexually abused. They are uploaded from cell phones, webcams, and computers. The cyber tip line for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children was created in 1998 as a way for the public to submit reports to the organization. Rare announcement from the state's top cop. He says the Department of Justice agents failed to follow up on tips about child pornography suspects. These images of my abuse have already been viewed and traded so much. I do not want that to be made easier in any way. We're being traded with like-minded predators all over the U.S. and beyond. 12 News obtained a search warrant that shows the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children notified Wisconsin's Internet Crimes Task Force. I don't think there should ever be a trade-off when considering the safety of children. One of the tips involved a man later accused of sexual assault of a child. Wisconsin State Capitol Police officer is in hot water after child pornography was discovered on his home computers. Now, according to court documents, a tip from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children led investigators to the Oconomowoc home of Sergeant Tim McCormack. Well, a former Outagamie County Sheriff candidate has been arrested for multiple counts of possession of child pornography. A tip was received through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and a search warrant was issued for his arrest. It's just after 8 tonight, we learned that police arrested Joel Hockmuth at his home in Waukesha while acting on a tip related to child pornography. The leader of the Wisconsin Veterans Policy Board resigned today as he continues to battle child pornography charges. West Dallas Police Sergeant is arrested and charged with having and viewing child pornography. Now, he is the director, as we say, of communications for the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, which is the third largest Lutheran church body in the United States. Wenzel has since resigned from his position at the Sheriff's Department and is currently being held at the Waukesha County Jail. It's Governor Tony Evers appointed him to the Veterans Board in 2019. To their shock, coming from a man with this kind of background. According to the FBI, Milwaukee consistently ranks among the worst in the country when it comes to the number of kids recovered during human trafficking stings. A Wisconsin State Capitol Police officer who supervises the agency's Milwaukee office is charged with felony possession of child pornography. He used to be a high-ranking sergeant with the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office, but now Philip Wenzel is headed to federal court. Milwaukee police officer has been arrested and charged with having child porn. Mark Hossmeyer, who's on your screen. All the colored points you see across the country are images uploaded in a week's time. Take a look at Wisconsin. And you see, you know, in the rural areas, and that's where the biggest concern is. All we are is a sex maniac. All of them. Uh, look at the goddamn computer up over there. It's all sex. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that. You know, parents should be cognizant of what their children are doing uh, on the internet and on their smartphones just across the board. They're game freaks. That's all they are. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, known as NECMEC, works with federal, state, and local law enforcement to identify children in photos who are being sexually abused. She might lose a kid then. Through their investigation, they discovered he had been a victim in a multi-state child porn ring. I'd rather have him home playing a game than out bumming on the street. I think that what was kept out, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, the jury didn't get to hear that at that particular time in the way that people viewed male on male type of sexual abuse was um, 
something they, they really couldn't grasp. In any you know, situation, always has been hard for men to acknowledge that there is sexual abuse between males to males. Would this be like terrorizing behavior? Like disregard for her children's safety in general, right? That That's terrorizing. Yeah. You have to assume she knew about that or knew something about that. And yet she was into the alcohol and the drugs and and as a way to kind of cope. And I think they found out that she did know that something was going on with the boy and did nothing about it. That's one of the things that I think made. My kids never, ever got in trouble. Never. I didn't say that. Maybe little stuff. I didn't say that. <clears throat> but why pin it on me? False statement of material fact made while under oath by a witness or by a declarant. I seen Stephen Avery sitting there watching the fire. Stephen Avery's 18-year-old nephew is quiet on the stand. But what Blaine Dassey tells the jury is strong testimony to support the prosecution's claim Teresa Halbach was killed and her body burned on the Avery property on Halloween. Are you testifying with the understanding that by telling this testimony you could be charged with perjury? Yes. Dassey told the jury Tuesday he returned home after trick-or-treating around 11 p.m. and saw his uncle, Stephen Avery, tending a fire. Blaine, tell the jury how big that fire was. It was about four or five feet. What was four to five feet? The flames. So five foot flames you could see at 11 o'clock at night, is that right? Yes. A person can commit perjury in the written form, can also commit perjury in the oral form. And in cross-examination today, Dassey told the defense he didn't initially tell police about the bonfire or seeing his uncle carrying that bag to the burn barrel. He said he told investigators later when they got in his face during an interview at a restaurant, they raised their voices and accused his family of trying to cover up for Avery. And that's when he talked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They accused you guys of not accepting that Steve was guilty, didn't they? Yes. They accused you of embarrassing yourselves by believing in your uncle, didn't they? Yes. They tried to convince you that Stephen Avery was guilty, didn't they? Yes. Blaine Dassey could wind up contradicting the testimony of his own brother. The question from the jury reads, could we please read or hear a transcript of Bobby Dassey's testimony? Bobby Dassey is Avery's nephew. He testified early in the case, telling jurors he saw Teresa Halbach walk up to Avery's trailer. Although he did not see Halbach enter the trailer, Halbach was never seen alive again. There's multiple reports. We can't, like I said, with so much stuff, yep. there's so much to get into. But there was reports that they, she was seen leaving the property by somebody else in the family. And Kathleen Zellner's put all this together and recreated things, and she thinks it has something to do with two other people in the family. It's just so much stuff. And I've always questioned Scott. Obviously, he's one of them. And the other, what's the kid? Uh, Bobby. Bobby. Yep. But the other thing you see are people who would choose a knife because of its intimacy with the victims. The person sees himself as delivering justice, a kind of a hunter figure who goes in like a mission. He wanted us to help him get rid of the body. Those comments by Bobby Dassey on the witness stand certainly caught the courtroom off guard. Bobby Dassey is Brendan Dassey's older brother. This testimony could seriously hurt the defense's case. So, you know, whether it was said or not, you know, I believe it was said because uh, Bobby Dass Dassey testified that it was said. So, um, yeah, it wasn't funny, and uh, certainly I think it hurts the defense. The defense also says Bobby's testimony differs from a police report given by his brother Blaine. Police records are providing conflicting evidence. The date that the witness gave was unexpected and raised other issues for the lawyers on both sides. Before Hallbuck was officially reported missing, if he wanted to help him hide a body. Now the comment was made after Hallbuck's disappearance first aired on the news, not before. 
Avery's attorneys will have to sort out the date the conversation happened, but even the special prosecutor was careful. Neither side would explain exactly why, citing evidence that's under seal. Scott, obviously he's one of them, and the other, what's the kid? Uh, Bobby. Bobby. Yep, Brendan's and, brother and Brendan's stepdad. Yes, and I wanted to jump to the screen and strangle this motherfucker. I swear Dude. I did. They it, testified. Ag- I tried. He testified against his own fucking brother. Yeah, and he's uncle. he's. That was what came up. What really started making that suspicious even before she came into the picture was he's saying this giant fire he saw that night, like ten foot flames over. I don't know. It was over the garage. There's no evidence in that trailer or in the garage. I want to talk about the parts of the case that the viewers are most angry about. And the producer came out and told us all to calm down. So we will calm ourselves. <laughs> Teresa, this is a case that generates a lot of emotion. And okay. people can't get past their own emotions. Yeah, they're right. And the fact that two members of Brendan Dassey's family are suspected by Kathleen Zellner of having been involved in the murder. What has been the residual impact of that on the Dassey family? That in itself was a tricky thing to navigate. It has done a lot to sort of tear at the family. But what you do see with Kathleen, because she is incredibly thorough, that she really tries to address every piece of evidence that was used to convict Stephen Avery. So she's doing it pro bono. Okay. So she actually truly believes in him. And she says... Several Wait, so she's not getting paid? Right. Wow. And then on the Brendan Dassey side of things, ultimately the seven-member court overturns the decision of the three-person court of appeals. Yeah, I mean, Brendan's confession can no longer be attacked as having been involuntary. Like, that issue is dead. He would need lawyers to do what Kathleen's doing, essentially try to develop new evidence. Right now, Kathleen's the one looking for new evidence, so she would be the one that might find something. But you can go back to the state trial court, is, is Jerry's point, and uh, that... That remains open to Brendan. And in Avery, he is in the state court. Kathleen yes. Zellner is, yes. Yes. Uh, is uh, attempting to get a new trial here. One of the arguments is this thing about uh, potentially exculpatory evidence. And I say potentially only to be unbiased. Seems to me to be totally exculpatory evidence. The, one of the chief prosecution witnesses was Brendan's brother. He testified early in the case, telling jurors he saw Teresa Halbach walk up to Avery's trailer. Uh, and uh, some information was found on Brendan's brother's hard drive or CD or something in his computer that was not fully disclosed to you guys in the trials. That fair that's, statement? That's what, what, fair what's statement. on that CD? What's on that hard drive? Um, Detectives went through his Google search history. They told me what they found. A, a bunch of uh, incriminating searches. Um, some depicting the rape of young children. An internet search that could eventually be used against him in court. And some of these really uh, chilling uh, searches and, and also pornographic uh, imagery. Uh, Teresa Halbach is begging Brendan for her life. Are awfully like um, what happened eventually to Teresa Halbach. There appears to be yet another twist in the murder of Teresa Hallback. The attorney for Stephen Avery filed a new motion today claiming a different nephew of Avery's planted the car of missing photographer Teresa Hallback at the Avery's salvage yard. Who is Brendan's older brother who left the property right at the same time as Teresa Halbach. The new witness identified as Thomas Sawinski claims he was delivering newspapers to the Avery Salvage Yard during the early morning hours of November, November 5th, 2005, when he saw a shirtless Bobby Dassey pushing a vehicle like Teresa Halbach's down Avery Road toward the junkyard. Pushing the car, the um, RAV4, onto the Avery Salvage Yard in the middle of the night. And this was somebody that had been had seen this and reported it then, and the cops never got back with him. No, they said, we already got the guy. Came forward on May 10th, revealing that he saw Bobby Dassey driving Teresa Halbach's RAV4 vehicle in the days following her gruesome death. And Bobby Dassey is the brother of Brendan Dassey, who you may remember was convicted in the murder of Halbach, along with Stephen Avery.
I guess in Wisconsin, having multiple eyewitnesses place you in possession of a murdered woman's vehicle is not enough to connect you to that murdered woman. And, and why was this not a basis like this for at least further evidentiary hearings or potentially a new trial? It, it should have been. No new trial in the 2005 murder of photographer Teresa Halbach because of Kratz's connection. He's got too many buddies and police department all over it stick up for him. Appellate judge in the state of Wisconsin who has conflict of interest but keeps denying Stevens appeals gets sent up to a higher level of the state. She filed it with the Court of Appeals and then they sent it back for a hearing with the trial court. At least we thought there was going to be a hearing about it. And the trial court denied the motion, said you don't get a hearing. So it seems like a vicious cycle. You still need to know where to go to visit these horrible websites. The number of tips compiled by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has exploded in recent years. Is the genie out of the bottle? It is. I, I, I worry about that. I really do with uh, all that you're saying and all that's available to young people. There's marketplaces, there's horrible things on there, like you said, for kids. And, uh, and even like murder for hire, there's, there's counterfeit money, there's fake IDs, you know, there are all, all kinds of different websites that do horrible things. You have kids as young as 10, 11, 12. Sure. And w so that leads me into the research. W what's coming? What, you know, what's coming? What's, what's out there? The inexorable grinding of a machine that is producing potentially error Knowledge this is a real woman who is dead and yes. she has a family. You would think they would want to know the absolute truth right. and not just settle for a conviction to make them. I don't know how that makes you feel better, is what I'm saying. I know. It's not going to bring her back. That they are finding evidence. Michael Halbuck, Teresa Halbuck's brother, says he welcomes the national attention to help find his missing sister. Surely somebody in that family has heard, hey, there's some stuff on there that kind of looks, you know, this, this way. Exactly. It and It seems like at least in part two we would see. I, I would want, I, I just wonder that myself, have they actually watched it? Investigators tell us they have subpoenas for other areas and won't rule out even looking out of the state. And the investigation continues now with the help of the FBI. Oh, we need all the help we can get. We don't know what happened to Teresa Monday afternoon. Um, she could be uh, right under her nose. She could be across the country. Michael Halbuck was in our studio Wednesday for a live interview with Fox News Channel. Maybe it hopefully brings some leads as to where Teresa could be. If there's something so wrong with the documentary, especially season two, which brings up the real questions. They will call her on the phone and say, can you go over here and take the picture of this the thing that whatever make contact with this person. A disturbing story tonight about a Green Bay woman facing six felony charges. Those charges include abusing a child, exposing a child to harmful material as well. Fox 11 is not identifying the 25-year-old suspect to protect the identity of the alleged victims. The woman was in court on the charges today. The 14-year-old also told police she has smoked marijuana with the woman. The 14-year-old also says she's watched pornographic movies with the woman. Tonight with a disturbing admission of child pornography from Manitowoc County. Police say a woman has admitted to having sexual contact with and taking pornographic photos of a two-year-old with the goal of selling those pictures. And there are more alleged victims. Documents filed in Manitowoc County Court paint a strange and troubling situation involving three young victims. Police discovered pornographic images of children on a phone earlier this month. The man told police he made an agreement with a woman that she would send him pornographic photos of children and he would try to sell them on the internet. Purchases from a child porn club. Never saw anything in a clean. It was always clean. Never saw anything in a line around. No, no, that's a toy. It was nice. 
Yeah. No, I was surprised. You ever talk, <laughs> did he ever talk about with you uh, communicating on a computer in chat rooms mm -hmm. or sending email to other people mm -hmm. over the internet? I didn't think he was. Is he that computer savvy? Is he capable of doing those sorts of things? That's what I mean. I don't think he is. Have you been in Stephen's residence? Have you ever seen pornographic material on that? Yeah. Does he keep photos of young children or nude women? No, or not that I a young girl trying to make a living <clears throat> taking pictures. She loved taking pictures. It she, was her gateway into a bigger photography yeah. career and stuff. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's supposedly <laughs> this girl. The a customer who we believe uh, their proofs and film you have. Uh, need those really quickly. They're kind of desperate for those. There are demon worshippers in the cul de sac. And you enter Manitowoc and you start talking to locals. It is readily available without a question that they absolutely sincerely believe that there's these pornography rings. And when you look at Teresa, who's taking daytime pictures of children, and then at nighttime she's taking adult entertainment photos. We start getting some fuzzy lines if you follow my drift. Because right now, this conversation we're having is the opportunity you have to tell it all. He says this can happen to any family, in any house, in any neighborhood. The Human Trafficking Task Force of Greater Milwaukee says the average age of a victim is 13. But we know that a lot more uh, trafficking victims are starting to come up that are at least 11 and 12 years old. Experts say the social media site tipped off the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Bobby Dassey took the stand. The prosecution says he was the last person to see Holbach alive on Halloween. I've seen Teresa Holbach get out of the vehicle and start taking pictures. She started walking over to Steven's trailer. You could see that from your location? Yeah, through the window, yeah. When you walked out to your vehicle to go bow hunting, did you um, notice if that uh, teal or blue SUV was still in the driveway? Yes, it was. It conflicts with things Bobby Dassey's own brothers have said. So Bobby's kind of got one, at one end, he told somebody that she left. On the other end, he testifies that she didn't leave. So his story is not consistent. Consistent. So, okay, what is the most convincing evidence against Brendan? In my opinion, there is no evidence against Brendan. The, the, that family, and the Dassies in this case, or the Averys, whatever, is, she should have never let her son be in there no. without her sitting there. No. I don't know, do you have any other thoughts of like maybe why? I think it's um I think it's a reflection not only of the consequences of how she was raised. You know, she knew immediately something was wrong. Absolutely. He he's a simple guy. There's clearly something's not right about this. It smells nice in here. Really? Wow. I don't understand why people can't keep the house clean or the animals. Somebody still plays with dolls. Well, what you gotta understand is you look back at your life, okay? There's been some things, now that you're older, you look back from when you were younger, and it was, it was a messed up situation that you were born and raised in. Okay, we're aware of some of that stuff, all right? That was your whole family, right? And that's not your fault, and that's not even your brother's fault, or your sister's fault, for being raised in an environment like that. And maybe you came out okay through that environment, all right? I don't know how well your brothers came out through that environment. All right. There's stuff there that disturbed Stephen, okay? Disturbed Chuck and disturbed you and disturbed Barbara, certainly. And because people say, well, oh, she was so, uh, she was so innocent in all of this. No, she wasn't. 
She really wasn't. She couldn't have been. The dynamics of the family. Well, it ain't only me. It's your kids, too. What do you mean? Your kids are saying something. But what? Um, I ain't going to get into that. What really like solidified it for me when I was first starting to look into this case was the child pornography. So, do you want to talk about where they found those photos? Then back that up with, you know, the sick sexting from King Kratz and the nasty photos that are being stored on the DASI computer. So, extremely corroborative of sexual abuse. I mean, people like to make so many excuses. Many, I've often said many, and I've learned this through working with juveniles, many times an incident can happen, a lot of kids go through, and it doesn't bother them. But there's going to be one that it does. And for whatever reason, you've got to get to that one. And before it's too late, before they do something really bad. My kids aren't saying shit. Deep down, Barb knows she's sleeping with the enemy. No, the reason they won't release the Scott Taddock report, he was he was trying to protect Bobby, but he threw everyone else under the bus, including Barb. Against this incest, even it, it was even, quote, worse, if you will, because it was in the family. It was incest. So who would say something like that? I did something to the boys. I don't know. I didn't read none of the shit, okay? It came from him. How about you? You uh, He said you and Brendan were having sex or something? <coughs> Shut up. Or Brian? She wasn't the, uh, she wasn't the victim, if you will, in the family. Oh, she is absolutely the villain, until she can explain how she went from telling police there was no fire to telling police there was a rather large fire with both Stephen and Brendan beside it. And all three of them, Bobby, Barb, and Scott, are culpable, and they are responsible for these continued injustices if they are going to continue telling those lies that are being used by the state to maintain the convictions. And as a result of their actions, my brother and my other son are in fucking jail for who knows how many more goddamn years. Yeah, nobody looked out for me at these uh, uh, 12 years. <laughs>